This is the sticking point. Is <laughs> Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> we don't normally film at this time. <laughs> no, so. apparently not. <laughs> uh, anyway, so. Welcome back to another episode of This and That, a coffee chat with the Harrahs. I'm Kelly, this is my dad, Scott. And we have an update this week. Finally, we've actually made it onto podcast channels. Yes, we have. So, we are on Apple, Spotify, Podcast Index, if you use that, Amazon Music, Pandora, iHeartRadio, and Deezer. Also have no idea what that is. Yeah, Deezer was different. Um... I had not heard of it, but apparently it's all around the world. And you you had to classify what kind of podcast you had, which is nearly impossible. So I put it under the general knowledge uh, <laughs> category because we weren't sports solely. We weren't a specific sport because that was also mm, a choice. An We're not 100% business. Correct. Um, correct. And we're not entertainment. We're entertaining, we hope, at least to ourselves. Um, so I just went under general knowledge and I, I, I had to choose something. And I, I didn't have a phone a friend available, so I, uh, that's what I went with. General. Yeah. And then we're also, of course, on YouTube Music as well, which we've always been yes. on with this uh, particular podcast. But yes. Mm -hmm. um, very happy that we've made that step. <laughs> you can also find on our website uh, oh, yes. mm -hmm. a link to the latest episode. Actually, you can just play it from our website. So mm -hmm. if, uh, if that's how you want to find us, that's possible too. Yeah. We've actually entered the real world now. Yeah. We're <laughs> right up there. Uh -huh. So I think we're going to rearrange the order a little bit today and start with a little bit of real estate. Talk. Okay. Um, I was looking into some YouTube analytics actually and uh, came across a search question of why is the housing market not crashing? And I thought, you know, that's a topic we can actually answer the question to. Okay, so why has the housing market not crashed yet? <laughs> so or, or why is it not crashing? So it is moderating, and we have a chart that we'll put up on the screen. We if have you several, are. actually. Yes, if you are actually uh, watching this and not just listening. Um, but in this chart, you'll see that year-over-year -year changes in home prices back in like 2020 or 2022. Sorry, um, we were looking at you know 20 percent or close to 20 percent for a lot of those months. Now we're looking closer to 5%. And we have a slight downward trend month over month here of the amount of increase. Actually, it's year over year for that month, comparing one month to the previous year, same month. Yes, and it's trending down the amount of It is of trending down, yes. Decrease, yes. or the amount of increase is trending down. Yes. 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 So it is moderating. It's not crashing, but it is moderating, which helps a little bit for people who are considering buying coming up. Um, so why is it not crashing? Well, at the end of the day, pricing is a product of supply and demand. If you've ever taken a high school or college intro to economics class, you probably know the supply and demand chart. There's a guy named Adam Smith that kind of talked about that. Mm -hmm. And... At the end of the day, we still don't have enough supply for the amount of demand that we have, and so therefore prices are not decreasing, they are not crashing. But the housing market has a lot more that goes into what makes up the supply and what makes up the demand sides of that, because there are a lot of influences into the housing market. And so there's always going to be some type of movement because people have to move for jobs, people get married and buy a house. People get divorced and have to sell a house and maybe buy another house. People die and have to sell a house. People have kids, have People to get a bigger kids. house. Yep, 
And so the housing market always has some sort of movement, even in our slower markets, just because it's something that everyone has to have some version of, whether it's owning or renting. Um, so on the demand side, it is slower now than it has been you know, two years ago, three years ago, um, but the demand is not non-existent. So we're still seeing relatively low unemployment rates, although these numbers are starting to go up, which could be part of why demand is not as high um, as it could be. Uh, we have a slide for this as well that we can show. Um, there is a affordability issue with the interest rates as well, plus the yep. appreciation that we've seen over the last four years. Yep. So while wages have increased, they haven't increased enough to make up for that affordability gap um, with both prices and rates going up. Interest rates was one of my, my bullets for why is demand the way it is. Just need to be patient. <laughs> yep. The teacher will teach us all. <laughs> and then we've also been seeing trends of more families having their older relatives age in place longer. And so if people are aging in place longer, they're not freeing up supply. There's maybe more demand for um, smaller homes, senior living homes that aren't in a separate, you know, assisted living type of place. And so that's creating sort of a trickle down of demand at the high of the older age group that would normally be selling. They're still buying, they're still in the market, and that's affecting everyone else going down that's looking for a house that maybe doesn't have the same resources as that age group that's still in the market to buy. So all of those sorts of things are creating the demand that we have right now, even though it's less than what we have been seeing. And then on the supply side, we're still low, but we are slowly increasing. So on the, is it a buyer's market versus a seller's market? Um, typically anything between five and seven months we consider to be a balanced market. Below five months would be a seller's market. Above seven months would be a buyer's market. So I'm gonna pause you for just a moment because mm -hmm. for many people, me included, mm -hmm. uh, we often have a very strong recency, recency bias. Mm -hmm. And for the last five years, the, the concept that it would take longer than, you know, four weeks to sell a home mm -hmm. is completely alien. Yep. But historically, it would take sometimes six months to sell a home mm -hmm. and that's in a balanced market. Yep. So, so our August uh, median days on the market was at 53 nationwide. So getting close to two months which again is still on the seller's side of the market, it's just not two weeks. Right. So it, it's, it's interesting. It's one of the things that we're also having a conversation with, with our, our folks that are, are selling mm -hmm. that we're working with is that things are taking longer mm -hmm. and that buyers are being more picky because it's not like a home's going to go in that first weekend anymore. Right. And because the pricing is where it is, and if they're having to borrow money, they're very, being very picky about what it is that they're going to ultimately buy. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're starting to see those days on the market extend. Mm -hmm. We're still seeing a lot of homes though that are, if they're appropriately priced and they've been updated and upgraded and look really great, they'll go quickly. If it needs a little bit of work or might be a little bit on the high side, yeah. it might sit. Yep, because buyers, buyers are being more patient because they can be more patient. They're also being more picky about the other aspects of making an offer. So they're not just looking at price, but they want those inspections done and they're expecting relatively clean inspection reports. And if it's not a clean inspection report, they might decide to walk because of that because there are other homes on the market that they can go take yes. a look at. Um, they're expecting the appraisal contingency to be in play. And if the appraisal comes in low, they might walk because of that. So those factors are also playing in as, as buyers are able to be a little bit more selective than they were a couple of years ago. Yeah. So with 
inventory increasing. Um, part of the reason that this hasn't happened faster with, again, all the things that can cause a market to move, jobs, marriage, divorce, death, all of that sort mm -hmm. of thing, is because of that interest rate lock-in effect. And we've talked about this several times before, but if you're new here, basically this is the idea that sellers, a lot of sellers got locked in in those 3%, 4%. Would be sellers today, but yes. we're buyers. Buyers or refinanced. Or, or refinanced, yes. Got locked in on these really low 60 rates. 60% below 5%. Yes. And don't want to sell and trade out their 3% rate for a 6% rate right now. Um, and so even if they don't love their house and it's not perfect, they might decide to remodel or just wait it out a little bit longer and not sell because they don't want to give up those rates. Again, going back to the affordability issues, the increase in the price of housing combined with the increase of rates means that they might end up with the same monthly payment and get less house than right. they were getting when they in the current house that they have. Well, and it, it also, the other side of that though, is again, we're having buyers that are being hesitant. Mm -hmm. And some of them, and one of the reasons why we're having this segment, some of them are like, well, the housing market's gonna crash and I'm gonna get a better deal. That's not what we're seeing. Right. And so now you're waiting, and if you wait a year and the price has gone up another 5%, mm -hmm. you know, on a $500,000 home, that's $25,000 that the price of that home has gone up. Mm -hmm. Well, you could have been in that house at a higher interest rate, and then as interest rates come down, you can refinance out of that rate, yep. but be in that home that costs you $25,000 less. Exactly. So th there are the trade-offs. So if, if now is the right time to buy, mm -hmm. go buy what you want and what you can afford. Yes. And then as the interest rates come down, go ahead and take advantage of that mm -hmm. and lower your, your monthly payment. And a lot of the lenders right now are also offering incentives for when you go refi in the future because they recognize that this is going to happen as rates come down and so they're doing things like waiving origination fees if you use the lender that you used when you bought um, and so they're anticipating that this is going to happen as well and and trying to help incentivize yes. people to buy and then refi when the time comes yep. and then a couple other things i had on on why inventory hasn't increased as fast as we maybe thought it would um, with the slowdown of buyers. Um, so one is still that our building levels have been low for the past 15 years. 15 years, yeah. Um, builders really pulled back after the Great Recession. Again, we've talked about this before. A lot of the small local builders went out of business during the Great Recession. Um, and even the big builders were hit hard by it. And so they've been very hesitant to overextend themselves and end up with too much inventory that they can't get rid of. And we've already, and we've talked about it before, but we're you know, mentioning it again, you know, we're seeing even the big builders pulling back right now because mm -hmm. they see what's going on on the job market side mm -hmm. and they don't want to get overextended, as you mentioned. And so, new builds are just not coming onto the market at the rate that we really need to sustain mm -hmm. um, just normal growth in the yeah. housing market. Normal population growth. Yes. And really this came about because, again, of that underbuilding happening at the same time that a really large millennial population came to the age where they were finally able to buy. It took them longer, a lot of them got hit by the Great Recession happening shortly after getting out of college or kind of right as they were getting into their early phases of their careers mm -hmm. and then they weren't able to buy and there was this whole idea of, oh, millennials just don't want to buy a house. Well, it turns out they did. It just took them longer to get there. It also took them longer to get married. It took them longer to have kids. All these things that traditionally lead to people buying houses took that generation longer to do. And yep. so... So then you had a double generation effect mm -hmm. coming into the market at the same time, mm -hmm. which was somewhat what we saw during COVID was yes. a lot of those people getting into the market finally with the yes. low interest rates. And it, I believe if I remember correctly, it was just before COVID started that millennials overtook Gen X as the biggest purchaser demographic. 
And then obviously that accelerated through COVID with those low interest rates and that generation finally being able to be in a place to purchase. I will be really curious to see 10 years from now for Gen Z who are in some ways in a similar situation of the oldest of them right now are mid 20s towards late 20s and got hit with high rates, high home appreciation. And so if they didn't get in during that COVID time, how long is it going to take them to get into it? Right. Will they decide to buy? I expect they will. I've already started to see some articles with the narrative of, you know, Gen Z is redefining life goals and that includes not buying homes. Same thing was said of millennials 10 years ago and that was not actually the case. It was just they couldn't buy at that time. Right. It was a timing issue. Yeah. And so I will be curious to see in, you know, 10 years what this looks like for Gen Z. Yeah. And then I think my last point on supply is foreclosure numbers are still low. Um, And again, people have really low interest rates and most of them are fixed rates. Um, And lots of equity. And lots of equity. Through the incredible appreciation that has occurred over the last five years. Mm -hmm. And so they're not, they're not upside down, which is what we had was the case in the late 2000s. And there are a lot of adjustable rate mortgages in the late 2000s. And so when that new rate kicked in, it maybe became unaffordable at that point. And then there was that and they were upside down. A lot of subprime buyers Mm -hmm. um, that were approved for loans that they probably shouldn't be in. And uh, it is so much harder to get a mortgage these days than it was then. So, yeah. So more fixed rates, more equity in the home and more highly qualified buyers. It's leading to a lot lower numbers of foreclosures. And so that's another potential source of homes on the market that just isn't happening. So that's a a bit of a summary of why we're not seeing a housing crash, why prices are moderating and have been moderating here a little bit more in the last couple of years compared to the crazy COVID times, but we just, at the moment, don't have the conditions to produce a housing price crash. Right. And we've looked at this, not necessarily on on this podcast, but you and I have looked at this before, where we've gone back and looked at the Kansas City uh, Federal Reserve Mm -hmm. and looked at home prices during recessions Mm -hmm. in the past. Yes. And if you look at all the recessions from like 1973 forward, there's only been two recessions where home prices actually dropped. Yep. And they are both pieces of housing yep. issues. They were housing led recessions. Yeah, they're housing. So it was the late 70s and the stupidly high interest rates mm-hmm. from the late 70s into the early 80s and the Great Recession, which was also a housing led mm-hmm. recession. All the rest of the recession. So we've been talking about it looks like we're heading into recession. We're getting comments and. Uh, on our videos about, gee, I think we're already there, even yeah. though they haven't officially said so. Um, even in most recessions, the worst that happens is the pricing goes flat. Mm-hmm. But if you look historically at that chart, it was amazing how prices have gone up yeah. through all but the two mm-hmm. recessions uh, in the past. So, Which tells you that historically, housing actually helps lead us back out of recessions, yes. unless they're the ones that cause it. Yes. So should I talk about the economic news that we had this week? Yeah, we didn't have a super heavy week, but we had a few items. We had a few items, and you know the, the really important ones uh, that the Fed has been keeping an eye on, of course, are the inflation numbers. And so mm-hmm. we had both the consumer price index and the producer price index come out this last mm-hmm. week. Um, the producer price index increased by 0.2% in August, which pretty much matched the consens- consensus estimates for the week. In addition, um, I'll get to CPI in just a moment. Um, initial filings for unemployment claims totaled 230,000. Um, that was up by 2,000 from the previous week. 
and was higher than the estimate of 225,000. So we're continuing to see softening in the job market. Um, let me see, somewhere I have in here, my consumer price index also went up 0.2%, which was in line with expectations. However, the report showed that core prices climbed 0.3%, slightly more than expected. And so on an annual basis, headline inflation um, was at 2.5%, while core inflation was at 3.2%. Okay. Now, what is interesting, and I'm going to try to find my little note here, is that once again, the, the big driver of that is what they call, um, uh, let me see, uh, here it is. Um, the, most of the core strength came from the stubbornly high shelter costs. Boosted, Funny, we were just talking about that. <laughs> yes, uh, boosted by the Byzantine, as this article says, owner's equivalent rent, mm -hmm. which measures a measure that asks homeowners what they could get if they rented out their residence. Mm -hmm. The yardstick, which comprises a very large 27% of the total CPI, and that rose 5.4% from a year ago. And if you saw our commentary from last week about there's some economists that are arguing if you had reduced interest rates earlier, it would have impacted this mm -hmm. homeowner's um, owner's equivalent rent rate because that would drive the, the monthly payments down, so to speak. So, right. um, so the, this is the sticking point is Here's the forecast for tomorrow. <laughs> with a high of 94 degrees Fahrenheit and a low of 72 degrees. Thank you, Alexa. <laughs> oh. We don't normally film at this time. <laughs> no, so. apparently not. <laughs> um, oh. Anyway, so so this is that, that tug and pull that a lot of this inflation is related to housing costs. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, the, the, one of the fears, though, on the other side of that argument is if you lower interest rates, then that's going to drive more buyers into the market. We still don't have supply like we'd like to have. That's going to drive prices back up again. Yeah. So it's... Almost a no-win. It's almost a no-win. Um, I've seen discussions of stagflation again, which, if you're my age, you've lived through it once in the late 70s. It, it is not fun. I remember that coming up as a topic of concern when the Fed first started increasing rates in like 2022. And then I, that had sort of died away here for a little while. So it's interesting that that has come back up again. Yeah, Damon, who I believe is the CEO of Citicor, I will get the right thing flashed on the screen. Uh, he, he basically had a quote this week that he's not ruling out stagflation. He's mm. He's hopeful that it won't occur, but it's still on his mind as CEO of where we may be heading because of this this ying this ying and yang to pull on on housing costs. Mm -hmm. So, so those were the the numbers that came out. Now, what's interesting is we had talked about the Psalm rule before, which mm -hmm. was Claudia Psalm, who was a former Fed economist, and basically when unemployment increases by half a percentage point above the low point, um, that that's a- For three months. For three months, that that's a predictor of, of a recession. So she came out this week and had a couple comments, which I found interesting. And one of them was, so the first one is, she says, um, she's, she's basically saying that we've had two good months of inflation data and it's now time for the Fed to act because that's what they asked for. Um, she said in, the inflation data on its own would have gotten us a 25 basis point reduction next week when the Fed meets, as it should. And we will get a whole string of cuts after that. She goes, but the Fed funds rate has been over 5% 
and has been there for over a year to fight inflation. That flight fight has been won. They need to get out of the way. And then she later uh, commented that um, if you know the Fed has two jobs, stable prices and healthy job market, mm -hmm. um, that if Powell wants to deliver on this, his quote, we want no further weakening, no further cooling, they're going to have to like really move here because that cooling trend is well established. Until it is interrupted, we're going to continue to see payrolls drift down and unemployment rates drift up. And so she is very much ca calling for a half percent rate mm -hmm. cut next week. And then um, some markets are anticipating as much as 1.25 percentage points by the end of the year, which we're only talking three months. Yeah, that's a, a big adjustment. Yes, well, three and a half months, but yes. So um, looking for big changes in the federal funds rate moving forward. Matter of fact, just from last week, the market watch uh, anticipation, if you remember, I said 70% chance of a 25 basis points cut and 30% of a 50 basis point. This week it's 50-50. So it's moved 20% chance um, that we're going to get a half a point cut after this data just came out. And if you're in the housing market, Basically, the interest rates you're paying for a mortgage are already reflecting the anticipation of these cuts coming. So if you're looking at what is your housing mortgage rate, it's already down. Um, what this really affects is more like your credit card rates and your auto yes. loan rates and those sorts of... of the, the only question we have is how far and how many of those cuts are they anticipating? Right. Do the mortgage rates... Okay, they're anticipating a 25 basis point reduction. So if the Fed goes 50, is there another quarter point that might come off? Right. Not the full half, because they've already baked that in. And then where are they looking for November, December, mm -hmm. and those rate cuts? And when are we going to see those get baked in? Mm -hmm. Because it's not like they bake them in 6, 12 months in advance. They bake them in six, eight weeks in advance mm -hmm. uh, based on the data that's coming out. So yeah. that's all I have on the economy. Well, uh, it, it might get easier for buyers here coming up. It might also drive more competition. So that's what we... That's, that's the big question. All right. Should what? we move on to sports? Sure. Should we start with F1? It was a bit of a banger today. It was a good race today. Yeah. yeah. If, um, if you've been trying to decide if you want to get into F1, I'd say go watch the race from earlier today as we record Sunday. Uh, Aber, Ab mm -hmm. Aberbajan. <laughs> I can't do the English as English <laughs> drop because that's not English. What he's trying to say is Azerbaijan. Hey, or, there we go. Or Baku. Either would That work. would have been easier, but I couldn't <laughs> think of Baku. <laughs> Trivia question. Did you know that, that uh, Baku is the uh, lowest... Capital city capital? elevation. Yes, I, that was flashed mm -hmm. on the episode today. Yes, It's, <laughs> it's below sea level. It is below sea level. Yeah. That is a fun... It's a good trivia yeah. question. See that one on Jeopardy at some point. It hasn't already been. Yes. So, well, tell us a little bit about the Formula One race. So, as we've talked a little bit about this before, mm -hmm. um, we're getting towards the end of the development cycle for this car with new rules coming out in 2026. And all of these cars are finally starting to converge, at least cars at the front of the pack. And so, we had a really four way battle for the win today. Mm -hmm. um, amongst three different teams and that was not something that we've seen a whole lot of for the last few years no so the racing throughout the race mm -hmm. all the way through the pack yeah was fun to watch mm -hmm. you had people obviously racing at the tip of the spear uh you had lando norris who had a tr 
uh, horrible qualifying. He got caught out on a yellow flag that yeah. that on his his lap that he needed to get out of the first round of qualifying was nullified by the yellow flag. Uh, so he started towards the back of the field. Fifteenth. Fifteenth. He he would have been further back, but a couple cars had to uh, do major repairs. Yeah, take some uh, penalties. And took penalties, and two of them started from the pits. Yep. One of them took a grid penalty, mm -hmm. but they already knew that beforehand. The surprise were the two that had to start from the pits. So one of them was Lewis Hamilton, who had a new engine put in, mm -hmm. and and also changed the suspension on the car. So he had to start from pit road, along with. Was it Gasly? Five minutes later. Lando is the closest driver to Max Verstappen in the point standings. And so it looked like he was going to take a huge hit in the points. He had a tremendous drive and ended up finishing fourth. Fourth, because, yeah. Uh, Max Verstappen had one of the most frustrating races that he's had in a few years. Uh, basically couldn't move through the field at all. Um, you had Checo Perez, who this is one of his best tracks, and he showed it, mm -hmm. and was right up in the top three nearly the whole race. And then on the second or third from the last lap, he got in uh, contact with Carlos Sainz and destroyed both of those cars. Mm -hmm. And this one's not over yet. We're heading into the wall. And uh, what would have should have been probably a podium finish for him, no worse than fourth, yeah. uh, took him out of the race. Um, so Red Bull took a big hit in points, and McLaren, McLaren is now the manufacturer leading leader in the points. For the first time since 2014, fun fact. There you go. So And Esteban Ocon was the other pit lane start. With Gasly Ocon, it's all... They're both French. They're both French. I know. It's all the same to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't gone into the name bucket association that you do no, with... Another video. <laughs> with... We'll, we'll do that in another video. <laughs> anyway, continue on the race. Just just know that if I mislabel you, when, you know, like by give, calling you the wrong name, it's it's probably because you have a name that falls into one of my name buckets and to me they're all the same yeah the way my brain works mm -hmm. so anyway after three times I'll, I'll get your name right most of the time what you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things i have ever heard moving on uh what other exciting things were going on in that race so I have in my notes, is Ferrari truly in the mix, question mark. They've now had two good weekends in a row on two very different tracks. You mean as far as being competitive week in and week out? Yes. Yeah. Uh, two very different tracks, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Monza and, and Baku. Baku. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they were up there on, on both of them. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like a lot of their tire degradation issues from earlier in the year and last year have been taken care, taken of. care of. Yeah. And I think they got that taken care of, but then lost some speed earlier this year. And I think they've now picked up that speed again without losing their tires. Yeah. So I'm curious as to how competitive they will actually be the remainder of the season along with McLaren. And then can Red Bull figure out what mm -hmm. the heck is going on with their car because they have certainly regressed yeah. this season. And then Mercedes will pop up occasionally. They're not nearly as cons consistent as they would like to be. But they always seem to inherit other people's bad luck into their own good luck. If you yeah, look George, at George, George Russell ended yeah. up on the podium again uh, yeah. because a couple cars crashed in front of him. Yeah, which yeah. goes back to Austria when Max yeah. and Lando crashed in front of him. 
game on once again. This time it's the outside line. Oh, they make contact. He's got a puncher. He's damaged his front wing. The leading contenders for the world championship. Yep. And he, yep. He won that race. Won that race. Now, Hamilton, however, only because of the crash and the fact that Nico Hulkenberg slowed down for the crash, thinking that there was a caution. There's debris all over the track. They're driving straight into the sun on that yeah. part of the track that time of the day. And he got passed by three cars. And that gave Hamilton a point. Otherwise, Hamilton... He also had a pit road start, so it's not like he started where he should have started. True, but he didn't move through the field like Lando Norris did. True, yeah. So, and he was complaining about the car most of the race, so. He always complains about his car. Even when he's winning races, he complains Th about his that car. That is fair. <laughs> that, is, that is a fair observation. <laughs> that is fair. You know, like at least when Max was winning races by 20 seconds, he wasn't complaining about the car the whole race. True. Yeah, you are so right. <laughs> you are so right. Yes. So I never know how much to believe Lewis's radio messages as far as is the car really that bad or is he just that dramatic on the radio? Or are we only hearing the parts of his radio calls that portray him as being dramatic? And, you know, not all the time, because some of the time Toto has to get on there and tell him it's enough. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, or sometimes is he just trying to, um, because everybody's listening in, yeah. is he trying to throw a decoy to the competition? Mm -hmm. But um, Oscar Piastri drove a marvelous race. Yeah. And a lot of people have been debating about whether Oscar should be just handing stuff to Lando. And I think this week he really demonstrated, you know, there isn't a number one driver on this team. My contract says so, but also my driving says so. Yeah. Well, I think for all the people that felt like he didn't deserve his first win which I think we disagree with because he should have been given priority on that pit stop and he would have won that race most likely. Yeah. So, but for all the people that felt like that was not a legitimate first win, this was clearly... This was dominant. A win, yeah. Because he had Charles Leclerc up his tailpipe almost the mm -hmm. entire race and... After the first stop, yeah. After the first stop, yeah, once he took the lead. Yeah. And, and then after, even at the end though, he started driving away from Charles because Charles yeah. couldn't quite take care of his rear tires quite as well as, as Oscar was able to. And well, he had what, 30 laps of dirty air? That, that's true. <laughs> and, and it was interesting because the uh, McLaren engineer said, basically uh, we're taking care of our rear tires better. They're taking care of their front tires better. Mm -hmm. So, which means, you know, for the Ferrari, it turns more easily because the nose is planted, which makes the McLaren, by comparison, feel pushy. Mm -hmm. But I think he took care of that later in the race because we saw some pretty uh, loose turns uh, yeah. out of Oscar <laughs> when, yeah. when Charles was chasing him down. So Yeah, they both had some loose turns. Yes. So, I, where do they go next? They, so I also have this note, they go to Singapore next, which is another street circuit. And I actually really like this stretch of the schedule. Um, they've moved Baku from being spring to fall now. And I like both of these tracks. I don't know why in particular, because I feel like a lot of the time street circuits aren't the most exciting. True. But I feel like Baku has interesting races. I love the castle section of the track. That yes. always looks so cool, watching them go through that part of the track. Um, and then with the heat and humidity of Singapore. It's hot, it's humid. That always throws an interesting curveball into how well conditioned are the drivers. Well, there's that and because it's so hot and humid, they often get rain. Mm -hmm. And because it's so humid, unlike here in the desert, when we get a thunderstorm rolling through and 15 minutes later, everything's dry, yeah. that water stays on the track. Yeah. And so it makes it a very tricky, you know, do you need full wets? Do you need enters? Has the track dried enough for them to go back to the mm -hmm. slicks? And so there's, and then P3 
because it's so slick and it's a street course, one slip up and you're in the wall and your race is done. Yeah. So it does make for interesting mm -hmm. races often because it seems like it's always wet there. Yeah. At least one of the sessions, practice qualifying race, some point there's rain. Yes. Yeah. And uh, all right. Is that... How long? How far off into the future is that? That's next weekend. Okay. So we have back-to-back -back races. Isn't the, isn't there another like mini break coming up in the schedule after Singapore? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's that's good because I'm always conflicted on Saturday and Sunday mornings as to whether I'm watching the Premier League live or am I depending on on how early like this. We, I didn't watch any of this live because it was way too early in the morning. Yeah, I was. I turned it on at like 6 a.m. and I went, oh, it's already done. I was like, this must have been a 4 a.m. start time for us if it's So uh, when done. I turned it on 7, it said recorded three hours ago. So, yes, 4 a.m. start time for us. Yeah. So we, we weren't up watching it live. <laughs> I can guarantee you that. I managed to not spoil it for myself, though, and I was happy about that. You were able to stay off social media that long? Yeah, I know. Pretty impressive, huh? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, after Singapore, we go a month until we are at Coda on October 20th. Oh, US of A. Mm -hmm. So they do their kind of North America, South America swing yes. coming up here. Um, the other interesting thing coming up is we only have seven races left, but three of them are sprints. So on the can Lando catch Max front, he does have potential for more opportunities to score point, points. Yeah, twenty-four yeah. more points across those three sprints. Twenty-four more points because eight, the sprints eight points per sprint, right? Oh, I see. You're doing math. I am doing math. That's not fair. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. I thought you meant 24 points per race. I'm like that. No, that's no. not how that works. <laughs> no, an additional. 24 points across the three sprints. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I also made a note that from the IndyCar side that Pato Award is driving in FP1 in Mexico. So... Oh. Is he driving for McLaren? Yep, for McLaren. Okay. Um, so he'll be fulfilling one of their required practice slots there and he gets to do it in front of a home crowd. So I'm sure... That will be <laughs> stunningly bad choice by McLaren to do it in Mexico, where you know, yeah. yeah. Um, I saw, uh, I think a post off of his account that basically he was finishing the IndyCar season today, um, at Nashville and then heading to Europe for F1 testing with McLaren, and so they are putting him to work for the rest of McLaren season, it looks like. Oh, good, F1 McLaren season, so yeah, all right. So a little Very crossover exciting. coming up. Yeah. So this week in NASCAR um, was Watkins Glen, mm -hmm. a former Formula One track. Yes. Formula One went to Watkins Glen for 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, NASCAR runs a slightly different configuration. They don't go down the boot portion of Watkins Glen. but uh, I always love NASCAR running on road courses. Because, I mean, one, it always makes for interesting races, but two, they just look so funny on these tracks, especially ones like this or Coda that were made for smaller cars like F1 cars. Mm -hmm. They just don't fit, and they look really funny doing it. And up the S's. Meanwhile, leaders working through the bus stop. Chastain feeling the pressure from McDowell in second. A little further back in the top ten. Everybody dipping the tires off the exit curving through the bus stop. And well, you're so sideways going through <laughs> some of these quarters because they just <laughs> have to run over the curbs in a way that... Well, they, they make it fit. Yeah, well... <laughs> with lots well, of... Mostly. <laughs> Lots of stuff that would make the average Formula One fan <laughs> cringe. It's like, you allow that? Yeah, yeah we, we do. You know, to quote the Days of Thunder, Rubbin's racing. And Amity, he didn't bump you, he didn't nudge you, he rubbed you. And Rubbin's son is racing. There's a lot yeah. of rubbing that was going on at, at uh, Watkins Glen mm -hmm. today. Yeah, and um, it was not a good day if you're one of the playoff cars. <laughs> 
was a bad day if you're a playoff car. So 10 of the 16 cars in the playoffs all had an incident or a penalty uh, or both. As your Bra <laughs> If you're Brad Keselowski, you yeah. were involved in two pit road penalties and a car driving over the top of your car. Yeah. This is the orange and blue car side by side with Logano. Oh, Logano kind of gets into the six or vice versa, but either way, oh. man, what a hit for the 24. It was super tight. That is such a funnel through there. There was nothing between it. Here's the view from Tyler Reddick. Look up ahead. Um, so it was not a good day for him, not a good day for Danny Hamlin. I, the list goes on and on. Uh, William Byron didn't have a good day. Mm -hmm. uh, who else uh, got caught up in all this stuff that... Uh... I think Harrison Burton got caught up in something. Oh, yes, his car got tore up. Um, towards the end. And so yeah. uh, a lot of movement up and down. Mm -hmm. uh, Ryan Blaney was out on the first lap. Yes. Speaking of trying to make too many cars fit into one spot. Um, he had a fairly innocuous looking couple, you know, as cars were trying to get through the rack. Yeah, for NASCAR standards, I mean, that was They weren't very hardly, big hits yeah. and completely lost his steering. Yeah. And then uh, kind of raised a, an interesting question because the car had to be towed because he had no steering. And the tow truck took him straight to the garage. Mm -hmm. And NASCAR said, well, that means you're done. And he says, well, wait a minute. We didn't get a choice as to where the car was dropped off mm -hmm. because at a lot of the tracks with the new low profile tires and how low they run these cars now, now that they have diffusers. I mean, they turn these stock cars into race cars now. Um, if they get a flat tire often, they'll get high centered on the transition from the, the apron to the banking and the car can't go. And so they get towed back to pit road where they can change the tires and the car continues. Mm -hmm. And so he was very upset that NASCAR said, you're done because you got towed back to the pits. He says, we didn't get a chance to look at it. This might have been something. If it was a tow arm or something like that. Right. They could have fixed it on pit road in, in less time than uh, the, the uh, mandatory limit is for repairs. And so it's a conversation I think that they're going to have back in Daytona mm -hmm. this week because it raises a very good question. Why can I tow that car with a flat tire and they can continue to race, but I can't tow that car that might have a three minute repair, mm -hmm. um, but can't, he can't race anymore. Right. So uh, there were far worse tore up cars still growing around the track mm -hmm. than Ryan Blaney's car. Mm -hmm. and I think this is interesting because a lot of the time, once you've had outside assistance, you're done. And that's, it makes it a, a cut and dry rule of, yes. can you get the car back on your own or not? And but, you have an answer. But with this generation of car. That's changed things for NASCAR. Yeah, because the flat tire can disable a car. Yeah. And they just simply cannot move because they're high centered. Yeah. As much as I enjoyed this race, because it, it was thrilling right down to the end, mm -hmm. I have to say the, the Xfinity race mm -hmm. yesterday was even more entertaining. And it's an older style car that they run, and less horsepower and whatnot, but boy were those guys wheeling those cars around that track. And um, they were also dealing with fuel mileage, um, they had a lot of different things going on in that Xfinity race that from a neutral fan, I didn't have anybody I was, you know, necessarily cheering on. Right. Uh, from a neutral fan's perspective, it was a very entertaining race. And I've always been curious as to why, if you're a fan of racing, why most fans don't show up for the lower division series races at, at a, whether it's a NASCAR event, yeah. whether it's Formula yeah. One and Formula Two is racing or- Formula what, Academy. Formula Academy. It's racing. Mm -hmm. If you're a racing fan, racing at any level is entertaining. Mm -hmm. I have just a good time going to the local 
racetrack and watching local drivers race at Tucson Raceway mm -hmm. as I am going up to Phoenix and watching the cup drivers. Probably more entertained actually at the local racing <laughs> because there's some characters there, <laughs> yeah. you know? They're uh, not so PR trained. <laughs> yeah, they're not as well PR trained, that is for sure. So... Uh, well, and, uh, I was thinking about this actually also that when we go up to Phoenix for the races, we do try to get there for the truck series race, the Xfinity race on Friday and Saturday. Mm -hmm. um, and in some of the years past, we've had some really good races in Oh, the those... truck race last year mm -hmm. was probably, probably the, the best, best of the race. race of the three yeah. that we saw that weekend. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was a bang up show. And it was a half empty yeah. arena truck stadium what's the word i'm looking for <laughs> stands stands there we go <laughs> english as a foreign language is english yeah that <laughs> we'll bring a thesaurus next time and uh <laughs> i was getting in there <laughs> yeah i was enjoying it because i had the indycar race on my laptop going and the nascar race we had on the big screen going and so since they were on at the same time, kind of flipping back and forth, watching what was going on in IndyCar. Um, the, it was a race for the title, but it, 12 laps in basically was decided um, yeah. uh, because of willpower going several laps down. Um, but there was still some interesting stuff going on uh, at Nashville and, you know, 200 mile an hour cars, it's always entertaining. So, anything else on auto racing? IndyCar is done for their season. Um, hopefully, next year with them going to Fox. Fox. Fox TV. Yep. We will maybe have less overlap between NASCAR and IndyCar schedules. Um, I feel like so many of the races end up being on at the same time, and it'd be nice if they weren't always on at the same time. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see. Um, what will be very interesting is is that all of the Indy car races will be on broadcast TV on the Fox network, not necessarily on cable TV with Fox Sports 1 and Fox Sports 2. Um, the other thing, though, it was interesting when their schedule came out, is they will end their season by Labor Day here in the yep. United States. Because... End of August. What's that? End of August. End of August. Uh, because Fox has the NFL and they didn't want any conflict between the two sports and so they asked IndyCar to make it so. Yeah. And since every race will be on broadcast TV, that was a concession that IndyCar was willing to make. Mm -hmm. So, we, we, it's real early yet and it didn't work out this year, but I think we might try to see if we can get in the double header of Laguna Seca and Portland International Raceway. Oh, we're going to California now too? Well, you know, I was thinking it's not that far away, but you know, we'll, we'll have to just see what our calendars are like. Let me see, I think they're a week apart or two weeks apart? I think there's two weeks, if I remember what you read to me on the calendar earlier today. Yeah, let me see here. Five minutes later. Two weeks. Into July and then August 10th is Portland. Okay. It's a great time of the year to get out of Tucson. <laughs> I was going to so. say, we miss doing our summer vacations anywhere not here this year. And so, yes. Yeah, we might need to get something early on the calendar for next year to and make sure. And just make sure. sure it happens. Yeah, we yeah. get out of town in the middle of the summer here. Yeah. I don't have any other sports, so do you want to finish your sports? Yes. So uh, the NFL's up in full swing. Mm -hmm. I, there was week one overreaction on everything. And so classic. it's classic. And, and then you, so you, this week you see teams that were written off last week actually win this week. O uh, Oakland, oh boy, that's been a while. The Las Vegas Raiders <laughs> being one of them. And they actually, I think they beat Baltimore if I remember correctly. It's not like we didn't have this on like... 15, 20 minutes ago? Yeah, mm -hmm. I know. Um, there were a lot of games on, though, <laughs> so 
<laughs> the, the but the big news this yes, week. Yes, they did beat Baltimore. Yeah, was and I think that's a um, Kansas City loss hangover. I think the record for teams after following a Kansas City game is abysmal. Hmm. So, uh, pro tip there: if you're out there betting, please bet responsibly. <laughs> the other big news, though, this week was the Thursday night game with the Miami Dolphins mm-hmm. and um, the Buffalo Bills. And I didn't see any of this game. Well, Tua, the quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, and I won't even try to say his last name, uh, suffered yet another concussion. Mm-hmm. Easily the fifth that we know of. All of them have been extraordinarily severe, the, the you know, frozen arm type level of uh, concussions. Yeah, not good. And there's a lot of pundits calling for him to retire. He just signed a $215 million contract for, I think, the next five years, something like that. I mean, it's not per year, but I mean, that's the, like the total. Um, and so, you know, there, there are, He's thinking of financial considerations, I am sure. If you ask his family, they probably have other considerations that they're more worried about. Yeah, NBC Sports, Tua's contract has no concussion clauses, exceptions, or waivers. Yeah. So what it made me think about, though, was the, the difference between concussions in NASCAR and concussions in pro football. Mm-hmm. Um, so, two f- prominent, and one of them's in the Hall of Fame, one of them's going to end up in the Hall of Fame. Drivers left the sport because of concussions, one of them being Dale Earnhardt Jr. Mm-hmm. Now, Dale still occasionally races and will do a few races a year, but he basically quit because of the side effects and the aftermath of his concussions. And then two years ago, I think it was two seasons ago, Kurt Busch mid-season had a concussion and has never raced again and has retired from the sport. And so it, it makes me wonder what is different. They're both extraordinarily macho sports. And so it's not like you can say, um, that it's a, a, you know, people that play football are tougher and whatnot. And, um, you know, a friend of mine talks about, you hear golfers talking all the time, but you know, they're afraid of, the, of hitting it into the trees to the right. They're afraid of hitting it into the water on the left. Or, you know, they talk about the word afraid. Mm-hmm. And you never hear race car dro- drivers talk about fear. Mm-mm. Because you can't be a good race car driver if you have an ounce of fear in you. Um, it's just, they're just hardwired that way. So it's not that issue. And so I started thinking, is it uh, like when you're pulling three and a half G's in a corner, you know, is it a vision issue that happens because you've had this series of concussions? Mm -hmm. Is it an actual slowing of the reflexes because of the damage to the brain? to the extent that you understand why you're in that race car. You can't do things that you used to be able to do and needed to do for your safety and for the safety of others on the track. Mm -hmm. I don't know because the studies on CTE damage, particularly in football players, is pretty well documented now. The NFL loses a, a number of players each year retired players, Mm -hmm. to suicide because of the effects of CTE. This is a path I wasn't really thinking that we're going to go all the way down. And so I I just wonder, I mean, for me, when I saw two on the field, I'm like, if I was him, I'd be done. Yeah. Knowing what we all know now about concussions and CTE damage and, and all that effects. And then the clear contrast where... Kurt Busch and Dale Jr. were both at the peak of their careers. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Um, And yet they they walked away from the sport. Yeah. On the money side, 
Um, apparently, his contract carries more than $167 million in injury guarantees, and he also earned a $42 million bonus uh, upon execution of the deal. It does have some date payouts along the way, but he's hit $15 million of that $42 million already. Yeah. Um, well, the other interesting thing is... So. Is the owner of the Dolphins convinced to uh, to take jujitsu lessons to learn how to fall? Now, hmm. he, he didn't fall when he got this concussion because he was running with the ball and ran into the defender head first. Uh, which, dude, you have a concussion problem. You know, maybe slide, yeah. Um, live to fight another day, so to speak. Yeah. So, the jujitsu thing didn't work out in this particular case. Yeah. Um. Anyway, uh, I just found it curious the contrast between the two sports. Has the CTE topic been researched at all with auto racers? Not that I'm aware of. Um, and unfortunately, the only way to research it is you have to be dead right. to, to be a volunteer. And there's been a large number of former football players that have volunteered that when I go, yeah, go ahead and examine my brain. And, yeah. and so I've only heard about football players. That doesn't mean that there haven't been others right. uh, um, as well. Yeah. All right, time to move on. What, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> Are you done with sports? I am done with sports. Okay. That went on way longer than I thought it would. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, sometimes those issues need to come up. Yep. We can talk about happier things. Yes, let's do that. Let's move <laughs> on away from concussions and broken necks. So um, I finally did uh, some of my homework from the last few weeks of things that we had talked about. Okay. So uh, part two of Emily in Paris came out and I was able to watch the whole season finally. Um, I feel like there was nothing, I mean, it was sort of what you would expect it to be if you've watched the other seasons. There was nothing overly like surprising or shocking. It was safe. Okay. It was what you expect. Um, I am, that, that doesn't sound like a ringing endorsement. I mean, it's still entertaining. Okay. There's just nothing being thrown at you that you're like, oh, I didn't see that one coming. Okay. Um, I am curious because there is basically the running thread of this relationship that has been going since the first season. And it's been on and off for four seasons now. And I'm curious as to how long they will continue to play on this relationship because they're just using basically the miscommunication trope over and over and over again. And you can only do that so many times before it's like, okay, we've seen this play out before. And I feel like we're already at that point that I watch them like, we've done this several times. Like, can we maybe move on? Move on? Yeah. So I'm curious as to whether or not we will actually have a move on or if they will like finally get it together and actually like put these characters together. But we are once again in them being broken up and our main female character is now in Rome. So how many, well, the, maybe they're doing a spinoff and it's now Emily in Rome. You got to deal with the Italians instead of the French. I don't know. The marketing firm that she works for is, it ends with them basically opening up a Rome branch and that's why she's staying in Rome. Oh. So her job is taking her there. So how many episodes in total this season? Ten. It's been four seasons of ten episodes each, I okay. believe. Let me just double check that, but I'm pretty sure the others were ten as well. Well, we were having a conversation yeah. earlier so about... So 40 episodes total are out right now. Uh, okay. How in the old days, before streaming services and whatnot, a typical television season had 22 to 24 mm -hmm. episodes. Yeah. And I just, I don't know if I find it satisfying that I gotta wait a whole year for 10 episodes. 
yeah. for eight and some series. And with the writer's strike, that was more like two years that you had to wait for 10 I've been waiting a very long time for the second season of Andor to come out. Yeah. Yes, as an example. Well, and I feel like this leads into timeline problems because like this show, the episodes range from 30 minutes to, on the long end, 45 minutes. And so you can go through the whole 10 episodes in what, under eight hours? Mm -hmm. That's more math than I wanna do right now. I already did math. And so you, it's hard to feel that passage of time in the same way that you feel it with a 24 episode show that has a bunch of- How I Met Your Mother as an example. Yeah, that are either 22 minutes long or if it's an hour long show with commercials, it's a 45 minutes of content. Mm -hmm. And then you also have those weeks off sometimes. So that show for that season might run from October to May and you get eight months of time passage and you feel those eight months of time passage. And so it makes sense for how the storyline evolves. And I think that's something that streaming sometimes misses. And I was feeling that in this season of Emily in Paris because it was, it sort of felt like we were maybe in the summer at the beginning. It was sunny. We're in Paris. I looked this up. Average annual rainfall in Paris is about 25 inches per year. So if we're going through the fall after starting in the summer, I would expect to get rain. Mm -hmm. We know at some point that we reach Christmas and New Year's because those are both addressed and it snows. So we get that. And then we have more sunshine again after our New Year's episode, basically. So again, how much time passed between New Year's and the end of the, the season? Are we supposed to think that we've gone summer, Christmas, summer? I don't think that's actually how much time has passed, but we don't really know. And I counted one rain scene in the whole season and a couple others where maybe rain was implied, like it looked like the cobblestones were maybe wet, but it was not actively raining in the scene. Yeah, I and mean, so, if, if it was Emily in Tucson, you could get away with that. Yeah, and I was thinking about Grimm as another show based in a rainy place, Portland. Mm -hmm. Granted, Portland gets a little bit more rain than Paris. 38 to 40 inches, but yeah. yeah. But you knew it was raining in a lot of those episodes. It was clear yes. that you were going through fall, winter, spring there, and I just don't know how long these things happen in Emily in Paris. And so then when you're talking about, okay, has she moved on from this relationship? Well, that relationship ended 15 minutes ago in screen time. And we don't have any seasons except summer and Christmas. So how much time has passed? And like, what's this evolution actually looking like? Just not getting the feel of that as much for whatever reason, it seemed like particularly this season I was noticing that. A lot of the streaming shows are littered with complaints from critics and fans, and I'm not going to name any right now, but that the writing just isn't quite as good. The sense of time isn't being uh, shared well. Either just be really obvious with it and say, you know, two weeks later. Yeah. Yeah, you can flash that in the bottom of the screen, and we know it's now two weeks later. You yeah. Know? Did a fade to black, came back, and then there we go. There was another show, I can't remember the name off the top of my head, that I watched a few weeks ago on Netflix. And basically the premise was they checked in on the same date every year going forward. Mm -hmm. And so you knew because they flashed up, it's now you know July 15th, 1995. And then the next episode, it's July 15th, 1996. So you get that evolution of time. And so there's more of that ability to like suspend your disbelief that these things can happen. Right. Because they're putting in the fact that there's been this time evolution. No idea. No idea. Cannot tell when this season was supposed to start and when it was supposed to end. Yeah, it's probably a, a different video or a different commentary, but I mean, I think the art of writing has suffered 
in places that make shows. I was going to say Hollywood, but we now make shows all around the world. Uh, we always did, but now even more so than, than ever. Right. Uh, and there used to be writers' rooms, mm -hmm. and you'd have senior writers that worked with a lot of junior writers, and they taught them the craft. And I don't know if it was when the, all the studios started merging and it might have been budget cuts or whatever. And of course, you get rid of the expensive people. Which are your senior writers. Which are your senior writers. And those are the ones that were t teaching, basically, the next generation of writers how to write, how to storytell, how to create characters, how to world build. All those things that when you watch some of these very high-priced series on some of the streaming platforms are absolutely missing. Yeah. And and so, I mean, you're talking about just a, a little rom-com type yeah. show. You know, you're not expecting a lot of depth, but you're expecting a little bit more than apparently what you're getting. Like, just make it rain more than once in the season. We're in yeah. Paris. Yeah. <laughs> or show me for sure that we are going summer, Christmas, summer. I'd be fine with that too. Yeah. So, anyway. So my other interesting sort of question was, I'm wondering if this show actually has its first, like, true antagonist. Because it hasn't... I mean, it's sort of had your... Okay, this is kind of the antagonist of like this season or this part of the season or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I feel like we have sort of like new person that came in who's kind of see, coming across as being deceptive like from pretty early on. And so I'm wondering if it will play out that way or if again, this is gonna be like for this phase, this person's this way, but then they're gonna get their redeeming arc and mm -hmm. come back around because we don't really have like the bad guy of this show. Well, every protagonist needs a good antagonist. And uh, again, that's you know, part of story writing. Mm -hmm. um, even Jerry Seinfeld had Newman. <laughs> Hello, Newman. <laughs> that's before my time. It, yeah. But some of you out there <laughs> will know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that's my thoughts. You know, if season five comes out, will I watch it? Yeah. It, it seems like that you're left a little flat from this season. In some ways, yeah. I mean, again, it was just nothing new, I think. Yeah. Sort of the feel, other than we've moved from Paris to Rome, which, I mean, I'm okay with that. Okay. I have done very little watching of anything other than sports the last week or two so yes. i am i have nothing to share in the entertainment world so to speak i also have done one and a half because i'm not done with my second listens through of f1 trillion post malone's country album and so have sort of developed my initial thoughts on that. And again, not a Post Malone listener, you know, most of the time. So my commentary is not versus his other albums because I know nothing about his other albums. Yeah, when we talked about Post Malone and <laughs> him releasing his album, we got a very upset <laughs> yeah. Post Malone comment yeah. about this is his worst <laughs> album ever. Well, if you've been a Post Malone fan, this isn't going to sound like <laughs> yes. the rest of his albums. So Yes. So this commentary is only related to this album being as part of the country sphere of music, because that's what I know. And I think what was really interesting to me, and that struck me right away. So first track on the album is a collab with Tim McGraw. And I heard that the first time and I went, this sounds like it could be a Tim McGraw song it like fit, it made sense. And then I kept listening and went, not only that, this feels like a song that could have fit on a Tim McGraw album from the late 90s or early mid 2000s. It had that sound of like country to me. Okay. And so as I continued listening, I was like, okay, is this a theme? I would say for a good part of the album, yes, it is. 
the collabs sound like they could belong to whoever it's with. And for a lot of them, it sounds like it could be in the period that they were active in. Okay. So I thought that was interesting. It also makes sense to me why the singles are the ones that have been released because it's Morgan Wallen, um, it's Blake Shelton, it's, you know his name. Well, if I knew who you're talking about, <laughs> I, I would. Oh, why am I blanking on his name right now? Brad Paisley? No. One eternity later. Didn't do one with Garth Brooks. No. Uh, Luke Combs. Chris, oh, Luke Combs. Okay. Luke Combs. Anyway, because they're all current active artists and therefore their sound is current. Even Blake Shelton, has, he's been around a while, but his sound has evolved if compared yes. to his early, early stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And so hearing how that sort of all Dolly Parton's out. going to be very upset to hear you don't think she's still active. <laughs> well, you know, not as active as some of the others. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. And I'd be curious if you go listen to this album, if you hear the same thing in it, okay. or if that's just how I took it. Um, but some of them in particular really struck out, stood out to me as like, this is a sound that is not a 2020s single song sound to it. Well, this was Morgan Wallen. Yeah. And then it was. Yeah. So, speaking of Dolly, mm -hmm. saw an interesting little clip on Dolly mm -hmm. and you know, um, her big hit, I, I Will Always Love You. Mm -hmm. So, apparently Elvis Presley loved that song. And uh, so he had the colonel, his agent, call and, and ask if he could record it. Mm -hmm. And of course, Dolly was thrilled to death that Elvis would want to record her song. And then the colonel said, now every song that Elvis does, he gets 50% of the publishing rights. And she says, I'm not selling my publishing rights. Yeah. And so Elvis never recorded it, sang it to his wife on the steps of the courthouse when they got their divorce. <laughs> but that's the only Jeez. version that we know of. And of course, later Whitney Houston mm -hmm. made a storm and big hit out of it. Mm -hmm. And of course, she got all the publishing rights for that because she still owns all of her portfolio of, of music. Interesting. I've often said she's the, the probably the best businesswoman in Nashville mm -hmm. or America um, because she she knew even early days that that that's where her value was. Those songs that she wrote, yeah. that's where the money comes from. Right. And she's absolutely right so she still gets those residual checks mm -hmm. so yeah i think you'll have to listen to this album at some point all right i will i will listen to it on one of the um services that carries our podcast <laughs> yes good time to flash it up on the screen once more uh, yes you can listen to this on these platforms and i will also be curious to see if he does another country album in the future or if this was a one off and then he goes back to what he was doing. It it makes me it makes you wonder what motivated him to do this in the first place. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you never know, you know, he's on a camping trip someplace and Yeah. Got introduced to country music and fell in love with it. Or, well he's from Texas originally, so Well then he probably grew up with it. <laughs> so I yeah, it'll it'll be interesting to see. If he does do another album, I'm curious as to what it will sound like because he only had three songs on this that were his exclusively. What What were your thoughts on the three solo songs? I haven't listened to them enough to really know, but I don't know that I know what his solo country identity is based off of just those three. Okay. Again, need to listen to them more, but... That's why I'm curious as to, okay, if he does another one, 
that's more of just him, what is his country sound going to be? Okay. So. All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as my homework to do <laughs> at some point in time. I don't know when. So I think that was my homework that I got done this week. <laughs> okay. So next week, it might just be me. Uh, Kelly will be on a airplane at at the time that we normally shoot this. Unless we go early Monday morning. Unless we do it early Monday morning, which I might advocate for because, you know, I'm just me by myself. I don't know. (laughs) I already drawn on enough as it is. Well, until then, do you have anything that you're looking forward to? So... Uh, I am actually playing golf tomorrow for the Ooh. first time in at least two months Yay! because of my lengthy illness mm-hmm. and it's not going to be 100 degrees tomorrow, mm-hmm. which is good. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of curious now, we've closed the practice center for overseed, which means I haven't swung a club in over two months. I have no idea. And we're just going to hop onto that first tee and see what happens. Have fun with that tomorrow. Yeah. I might only play nine holes. I'm just going to really manage and listen to what my body's telling me. That might be a good idea. Yeah. And especially since we don't tee off until after 10 o'clock. So it'll be... Yeah. I mean, while it's not 100 degrees, it still will be warm. Yeah. We had a little remnants of a tropical depression move through Arizona today, and so it's cooled things off a little bit, but... It's going to be a little humid. It's going to be humid, yes. Yeah, by our standards. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Hopefully I will survive. Yes, that that would be preferable. That would be preferable. If not, then Kelly will be here (laughs) next week by herself. (laughs) Yeah, I'm looking for someone to edit these last minute. Yes, yes. Well, you know, you can always learn the software. <laughs> yeah, in a week? No. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's sort of funny that that was your looking forward to because mine was fall weather, question mark. Um, we don't have any 100 degree days in the 10 day forecast right now. So maybe our heat will be... On mine, I saw one ninety-nine degree day. That's not a hundred. It is not a hundred, <laughs> but it's still like warm. Yeah. The, the nice thing is we're at the time of the year now where it starts cooling off. Yeah. Very Nights quickly. Are, are getting better. Yes, and so that helps a, a ton. And then once once the winds shift and we get the dry air, then it really cools off at yeah. night because that dry air cools so fast in the evenings. I did do a little research and in two of our last four years, our last 100 degree day was not until October. So might be a fall. It's it's like in Oregon (laughs) when we get that false spring and the sun comes out for a few days and all the flowers bloom and the grass grows and everybody's all excited and then it rains for another two months. Yeah. This might be our false fall where we think we are done with triple digits and then they come back in a couple weeks yes but i am optimistic if not realistic (laughs) on look it's it's actually all in all been a very manageable summer for us so i think we've had more 100 degree days than you think well i I'm not judging it by that. We, I think we've had fewer 105 degree days and 110 degree days than we've had in the last couple of years. So as of this past Wednesday, we've had 91 days of 100 or more. Okay. Which puts us in fourth position for the most 100 degree days in a year. And but we've I, I, had 39, 105 plus degree days, which is also fourth. Well, look, I did spend most of the summer indoors because I wasn't well. So I missed out on a lot of that fun. And we've had six, 110 plus degree days, which puts us 
tied for eighth. Look, this is not the kind of marketing we want to do <laughs> on our channel for living in Tucson. So, I mean, actually, I, I do agree. It wasn't that bad until like the last month when the monsoon stopped because we had a pretty good monsoon until about right. midway through August and then it kind of dried up and September's been quiet on the monsoon front. Yes. So, yes, it's been better. We've just had some hot days also. Well, and maybe that's what it was is because we were getting the relief of fairly regular rain. Yeah. So even though it was 100 something, it cooled down to, you know, 78 very yeah. quickly when a storm would roll through and yeah and when that's happening every other day it's not it, as bad it's not yeah it, it breaks up that monotony of hot day after hot day yeah even though it was a hot day it wasn't a hot day all day all day yeah yeah <laughs> exactly you live in the desert you develop this kind of logic <laughs> yes well you're the one that walked outside and it was you know 73 degrees out and you're like oh it's kind of chilly Yes, that is true. Yes, the other morning I went out, out in my back area, and I was like, oh, it's a little chilly out here. And I'm like, I've become a complete Arizonan now. 73 degrees, I might need to go get a jacket. Yeah. <laughs> you do adapt quickly, that is for sure. Yes, that is absolutely for sure. All right, do you have anything else? I think we've rambled on for far too long at this point, so... Uh -huh. Yeah, I think it's this might be our longest oh, podcast. Yeah. I'm going to say yes, we, not even looking. We might need to break it into two parts or something. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Well, with that. With that, one of us, if not both of us, will see you next week. Have a good week. Take care. Bye.